All right, guys, welcome back to F1 News. Verstappen on pole for the Aussie Grand Prix as the Ferrari challenge falls away, but Lewis Hamilton, I'm sure, would far prefer to be in that Ferrari right now than the Mercedes W15. Mercedes again at a loss as to what's happened today after a promising FP3 session. Hamilton actually had a faster time in the final practice than he did in qualifying. What is going on at Mercedes? George Russell also not happy with their performance, but he does effectively imply that he thinks Hamilton should be doing a better job in the machinery they have been given. Very much untrue to your thoughts in the comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoy subscribe if you're new as always i would greatly appreciate this by the way a picture from last year's grand prix just to show where mercedes were last year compared to this year and we'll certainly get into that a couple of quick updates on the williams stuff they've confirmed that yes the chassis will go back home and they will try and fix albon's chassis for suzuka but by doing so they will not be able to build their third chassis in time so for suzuka they will again just have two chassis in place they also had this for jenna which is pretty remarkable to me. Yes, Albon crashed and of course causes all this drama with the fact that Sargent isn't racing. We discussed that in depth yesterday, but an Albon had a decent qualifying. We'll discuss it in the coming seconds. But in Suzuka again, and in Jeddah the previous weekends, where crashes are very likely, they didn't have a spare chassis. It's completely unacceptable from Williams. James Valls says that is the case, and that is the plan again for Suzuka. Maybe they can get the spare chassis in time for China. I guess we'll see about that. The Sapphire as well commented on this, because I said yesterday yesterday that I think even James Val said this it's going to be difficult to rebuild Sargent's confidence after this decision but it is nonetheless a decision that James Val himself decided to make for certain drivers though they would either not accept this or they would not let it damage their confidence maybe they would let it fire them up to some degree because Verstappen actually said I understand it from the performance side the decision to give Sargent's car to Albon of course but that doesn't change the fact that it sucks for Logan if that were to happen to me I would completely flatten my car so no but he could drive it and I'd get on the plane over, I think is also what he said. Kind of in a joking manner, but also would you put it past Max to, you know, do something to this effect? And I feel the same way about a guy like Max or, you know, imagine like young Hamilton or young Alonso or some of those other very talented guys coming into the sport. If let's say in a you know hypothetical universe, Verstappen came into the sport and was teaming with Kimi Raikkonen or something just back in the day, and Verstappen had just come into the sport, you know, he was still very raw, and Kimi crashed his car, and they said, look, Max, we're going to give your car to Kimi, just some, like, veteran driver of that kind of nature, former world champion, something like that. What would Max think? Would he do what he says he would do, or would he sit out the race deeply frustrated and go home immediately to, you know, <laughs> be angry and punch the wall or whatever, and then come back the next weekend proving the team wrong? I think that's kind of the difference in mentality between drivers that will take this kind of incident if it was to occur as a positive force or will get down on themselves. We'll see how Logan Sargent responds, of course, to this in due course. We did have a practice session earlier in the day. There was uh, lots of drama, really. Even and this from Russell I thought was just interesting indictment on Mercedes. We know their operations aren't as good as maybe they used to be and it does make you think how did this team win eight championships in a row guys i always find lewis at the worst point of the track every single time as in he's doing a lap and then there's hamilton there and they're like well why haven't you told lewis to get out of the way why haven't you told me when the drivers are coming up in the corners not ideal one thing that is noted for tomorrow's race is that during the course of the practice sessions the ferrari had the fastest race trim pace and arguably had the best tyre deck as well. Albert Fabrega was looking at the tyres and says that he saw more Red Bull graining than the Ferrari, although there were longer runs. His feeling is the deg is pretty high. They've actually increased that. Well, they've changed the tyre compounds so that the tyres are softer, one step softer this year than last year. He believes there'll be a medium hard, hard race. That's his expectation. And his feeling is the Red Bull may have more degradation than the Ferrari in this circumstance. And that's why Leclerc is so frustrated today because he came into this qualifying session feeling that, you know what, if I stick it front row, if I stick it pole, there's a great chance to win this Grand Prix. Maybe Sainz will feel the same way. And let's be real, come race Sunday, more than likely, you know, the Verstappen Red Bull no tyre degradation will be back in full force and he'll be driving off into the distance. But honestly, who knows? It felt like a weekend where an upset was possible, but now it doesn't seem so likely as we'll get into. During this practice session, though, there was Mercedes again messing things around. They messed with so much on Hamilton's setup yesterday during practice and 
that obviously didn't work. So they were like, you know what, we're going to go back to something else. But he was losing so much time on the straight. And this seems to be what Mercedes are saddled with again. They don't have the downforce from the rear of the car to actually have a stable rear. So they now need to add on loads of downforce on the rear wing to allow that to happen. And you can kind of get away with it a little bit when there's DRS in qualifying. But in the race, I think their car's going to be a brick in a straight line. That seems to be the sacrifice they need to make right now, Mercedes, to actually make the car more stable. Hamilton said during quali, or during practice, sorry, not during quali, car's much better today, much more comfortable today, much more stable, right? He seems to be enjoying himself. And if you look at the numbers after, after practice, Leclerc P1, Verstappen P2, Sainz P3, Hamilton was less than a tenth down on Leclerc. The car was much better. Russell was two tenths down. And just look at this time. 116.8 for Hamilton during practice. Far different conditions, lower engine modes, higher fuel rates, all this type of stuff. Unless Mercedes were doing glory runs in practice, which I don't really think that they were, this time from Hamilton was faster than he went in qualifying, whereas Max Verstappen went something like eight tenths faster in qualifying than practice. And you would expect a big delta between practice and qualifying. Better conditions, rubber in track, engine modes, fuel loads, all these type of factors should improve your times immensely. That was not the case. One thing for Verstappen to note, now let's be real, this isn't going to affect his world championship win at the end of the season season, whatever he's going to actually lock in the victory because it's going to happen at some point. But he has taken a new power unit this weekend. After damage sustained possibly on Friday after running off track and stuff like this to the power unit because they took some pretty heavy bumps over these curbs here, these cars around Australia, they have a fear of a potential reliability problem. And even AMUS have found out that it took a violent ride over the curbs in FP1, was used in FP2, and Honda engineers don't believe that this engine is repairable necessarily. So that's already Ready, the second power unit into Verstappen's car. That means great power this weekend, right? The car's going to be loving it. Not a massively power sensitive circuit, Australia, but of course it is relevant. But in due course, possibly Red Bull will need to take another engine at some point and therefore take a penalty. Is that going to affect Verstappen's championship ambitions? More than likely not. But let's get into qualifying. Hulkenberg is out. Gasly is out. Joe is out, of course, with actually a damaged front wing. I'll just share this for you guys real quick as I just about have it up over here. That this front wing spec... Samba don't have another one. So he damaged it in qualifying and they don't have this same spec again. So as a result, they have to change their front wing spec, which is breaking Park Ferme, and therefore he's going to start from the pit lane. Not massively relevant because he's going to be last anyway, right? Because Sargent isn't competing because they took him out of the car for Albon, as we discussed. But Danny Rick... P18 was not the result that he was looking for and it looked like he was into Q2 but I think that everybody noticed that at turn 5, apart from somehow the commentators, at least on Sky Sports, that he got outside of track limits. Like It was so obvious he was outside of track limits but um, he kept pushing on the lap. I wonder if I thought he probably knew he was outside of track limits, to be honest. Maybe he was only fueled for one lap. I think there might have been time for him to abandon that one, recharge the um, the energy and just go again and try it. Because, um, I don't know, I thought it was obvious to everyone that that lap was going to get deleted. It did get deleted. But on the other side, Yuki Snowder, man, and I'm a big Yuki Snowder fan, and I really wish that he had a better shot of the Red Bull seats than it seems like he does. But I think ever since they gave the team orders for Ricardo to overtake Yuki back in Bahrain... Yuki has been coming different and he was P8 today into Q3. Phenomenal performance here from Yuki, really impressive. And Danny Rick was out P18. He would have got into Q2 if the lap time wasn't deleted, but it was. He went outside of track limits. Those are the rules. And Ricardo can't seem to figure out himself why he doesn't have the pace. Echoes for sure of the McLaren days. He's clearly not the driver he once was. And things have changed so quickly, right? Because it wasn't long ago we were discussing that Red Bull were considering sacking off Perez mid-season for Ricardo if the championship was close at the start of this year and if Perez was underperforming. Obviously, Perez is doing a respectable job. Nothing spectacular, but he's, you know, holding his own a little bit. We'll discuss, uh, of course, the way qualifying concludes here in a second and the penalty that he has received. But it wasn't long ago people were saying, yeah, put Danny Rick in the Red Bull for Perez. Now it looks like instead of Perez going out and Ricardo coming in mid-season, seems like Ricardo might be the one out mid-season and someone like Liam Lawson coming in. 
I wouldn't put it past Red Bull and RB, Cash App, Visa, whatever, Credit Cardo they call him sometimes nowadays, to make this type of a change and put Liam Lawson back in the car because, you know, surely it's got to be done. That day as well where Daniel Ricciardo did that test that, you know, would have put him on the front row alongside Max at Silverstone. I wonder what would have happened if they'd have put Liam Lawson in the car that day or whatever, right? Because as someone Marco says, he made it into the top 10 again. Incredible performance. He was always there without any mistakes. The top five teams are so strong that if you can get top 10, incredible achievement. So we'll see how Yuki does, of course, tomorrow in the Grand Prix. But Ricardo says, yeah, something isn't adding up about his times. And goes on to say that, yeah, he did his best lap of the season in Q1, but he lost it to track limits because he liked the lap and he was doing okay. But it still wasn't as quick as Yuki's. And he's trying to figure out why. I think the issue at this point might just be a skill issue, unfortunately, for Ricardo And it's tough how quickly the tables have turned. As I say, it wasn't long ago people were calling for him to get the Red Bull seat. Now the call is for him to retire. Because I know a lot of people are looking at RB and thinking, well, really, as the junior Red Bull team, should they not be for junior drivers to come through and build them up into the sports, given the amount that we have, rather than arguably, you know, a washed-up driver with good PR? I like Ricardo, but... I feel like that's a valid assessment of his current performance, to be honest, although it might be rather harsh. Now, his potential driver that he was trying to replace was Sergio Perez in the Red Bull. This happened to him, however. This is Nico Hulkenberg coming up into the final sector, if this actually wants to play for me. Here we are into the final corner here, and round the final corner, Perez is parking right on the apex as Hulkenberg is trying to turn in. Now, he's not caused Tolkenberg to slow down here. He can still take the line he wants to, but you see he gets this snap of oversteer as well here on the exit. And Perez being on the apex there is absolutely affecting Hulkenberg's lap cost him downforce. He missed the apex as a result. He got a snap of oversteer into the final corner as a result. So that hurt his lap time. And yeah, that was a three-place penalty for Perez. And I think understandably so. But the big story really was Lewis Hamilton out in Q2. Hamilton had a decent lap going, but he was still down four tenths in sector one, then like another couple of tenths in sector two to the fastest time at the time. But sector three should have been okay for the Mercedes on paper, at least the final few corners and Hamilton looked like he had a good enough lap to get through to Q3. That's the thing for Mercedes nowadays. They're not challenging for pole. They're not even close to those conversations. Their challenge is to get into Q3 and Hamilton had a good lap until the very final corner. He had a very similar moment actually to Hulkenberg did. Snap on the exit of that one. Cost him probably a tenth and a half. Couldn't improve his time enough in that final sector and then when Lance Stroll came through with a good lap, especially today, got a good credit to Stroll and then also Yuki Tsunoda, that pushed Hamilton out out of qualifying in P11. And that's what I just wanted to say this, right? This is the sacrifice Mercedes have to make. The Red Bull is able to generate everything they want in the corners and still get this juicy straight line speed from their great DRS. Like Hamilton was at 320, Perez at 329. So Mercedes have to make so many sacrifices to even have a stable car in the corners that they're again so slow in a straight. Perez, by the way, was P3 in the ends. Sainz nearly got pole. And Verstappen, I think they made a few setup changes, Red Bull. They dropped the downforce a little bit. They played around and they thought, you know what, gripping up in the final few corners, that should be out of work. And yeah, Verstappen did really well, of course, to get the job done. But Sainz made a mistake going into turn nine, which is the fast left-right chicane. If not for that error, I think he was 17 kph down Sainz in those couple of corners to where Verstappen was. So if Sainz doesn't make that error there, then it's arguably a Sainz pole position. But we know that that's not necessarily enough to stop Max unless you have a couple of cars up there. So Max ends up taking pole by three tenths of a second. Then from Perez, Norris was P4. Honestly, the McLaren was looking pretty good despite being slow in a straight line. PS3 P6, Leclerc P5. He didn't have a great performance today. He talked about the fact that his, yeah, he couldn't really get the feel of the car like he wanted to, and he lost it a bit in FP3. So I'm not really sure what Ferrari changed on his car between FP2 and FP3, because Leclerc looked set to crush this weekend. And especially Sainz, you know, coming back from that appendix surgery to come in here and perform as he has a couple of weeks later, incredibly impressive on Carlos, given that he's not at 100%. But I'm sure Leclerc's looking at Sainz and thinking, damn, if he's there, like, I should have been pole or I should have been right up there. And if you've got two against one, Leclerc and uh, Sainz at the front against Max, we saw what Mercedes were able to do last year at this Grand Prix, where they held back Max for several laps after getting a 1-2 and using the DRS games to hold Max back for a few laps. Then the safety guard happens, Russell's car broke down anyway, so Max won pretty comfortably. But there was a chance this weekend, I think, for Ferrari 
Ferrari. Maybe there still is a chance, but um, we've seen this before, right? But Hamilton was out P11 with a 116.9, which is a second and a half, or a second and a half, tenth and a half slower than he went in practice earlier in the day. Russell was on a 116.7, 116.9, which was barely faster than he went in practice as well. So the Mercedes was frankly pretty lost here. Perez does eventually get the three place penalty. He's down to P6. So his streak of not starting in the top three, I think, continues. And it has been that way now for quite some time. And this is the discussion really from Giannata de Kessa and the Formula Uno guys that, you know, to beat Verstappen, you need to make zero mistakes. Science was close, but he didn't make zero mistakes. Leclerc lost some aero balance with the evolution, but the car has lots of potential. The Mercedes appears and disappears and is paying 10 kph in a straight line to try and maintain some competition. And this is just what I wanted to mention. This is a good track for Mercedes historically. They have podiumed here every year for the last 10 years of the turbo hybrid era. They do not look likely to podium this Grand Prix. Russell starting P7, Hamilton is starting P11, and this was just this time last year. The Mercedes W13 wasn't great around here, but it wasn't too bad. Hamilton was running loads of sensors and experiments that weekend. If you guys had told me after the first few races of 2022 that the W13 would be the best car Mercedes would build of these Grand Effect era, as it looks like it's going to be right now, I'd have told you you were crazy, and after they figured out the Paul thing, they'd have got it right. But they clearly haven't. Here we are two years down the line, and the W15 is the worst Mercedes they have built so far. This is the W14, just to clarify from last year, of course, when Mercedes had a 1-2. Russell got Verstappen into turn one, Hamilton got Verstappen into turn three, and then they held the 1-2 for some time. As I say, safety car that happened, but, you know, they were able to hold back Verstappen at Australia, the same circuit. Here they are one year later at a circuit they did very well at last year. They scored their first podium there last year with Hamilton and they podiumed the year before with Russell. This year it looks like they're nowhere near being able to perform on that level and they're behind McLaren, significantly so. They're behind Aston Martin, significantly so. And AMUS were discussing this to try and figure out why and what is going on. But um, they say, yeah, Mercedes are still puzzles as to how they came from having a bit of a comeback in the third training session, as they described the third practice, to then falling away dramatically when it comes down to qualifying performance. So Hamilton was just sitting there like, look, I'm used to this now. I'm getting used to it, getting knocked out in Q2. Just kind of a flat feeling, though. He said a bit on George Russell as well. And he says that this year's car, he's treating it in some ways similarly to what happened in 2022, trying every setup that there was to try and help the team, try and find some sort of silver bullet. It feels like Hamilton, again, despite the fact that he's leaving the team, he isn't really there to score P5 and get some solid points. Like, he wants to win races, he wants to score pole positions, he wants to be on the podium at the bare minimum. So Hamilton is still, even though he's going to Ferrari, going to try what he can to see if they can fix this car, see if there's something they're not understanding on the setup where they can unlock more performance, because it seems to be there sometimes. But then they go to qualifying and immediately the car performance disappears and they don't really seem to understand why. As Hamilton says, it's been three years in a row, similar feeling. Then there's these spikes of art. It could be good like this morning and then it just kind of disappears. If we can work out a way of finding that goodness in the car and making it more consistent, holding on to that, then we can be more competitive. So Hamilton is really trying, I think, to find a way to make this car more competitive. It feels to me that George Russell is kind of more satisfied to say, you know what, the car isn't great. I'll just drive it to the best that I can. It doesn't seem like George is doing as much experimentation as Hamilton is, and maybe that's fair enough, and George is doing a better job. Hamilton says he's doing a better job with the car. Three qualities in a row, he's outqualified me, so he seems to be getting along better than I do. So I've got to keep my head above water and keep pushing. Let's keep pushing and all this stuff. Thanks to all those back at the factory for their hard work. And I still do feel like Hamilton, with a competitive car, if it's actually a good car, can be one of the only men on the grid that can possibly challenge Max Verstappen to a world championship. But there is an argument to say that as time has progressed, is Hamilton as adaptable as he once was if the car isn't as good? Is Russell just better at driving bad cars after his years at Williams? Possibly yes. And does Russell also deserve more credit for his performances? I also kind of feel like that's the case. But also I see people saying, oh, Hamilton's washed, like it's over and all this. And I think it's easy to forget, maybe, for some people at least, that it wasn't many months ago that Hamilton was P3 in the championship, nearly P2 at the end of the year, and dominated Russell over the course of the season. So Hamilton hasn't forgotten how to drive. But I think 
think Hamilton isn't particularly motivated by getting into Q3 or by, you know, scoring some solid points for the team. What motivates him is wins and championships and podiums. Russell seems to be more motivated by beating Hamilton. I think, like, I've had this feeling now for, for quite some time. Certainly Singapore, I think, last year was a good example of this. Now, I'm not saying that Russell would be happy to finish P19 if Hamilton was P20, but I think that applies to some extent. The Russell is sometimes more focused backwards than he is forwards, and as Russell says, I'm not having the fluctuations in confidence and performance on my side of the garage or in my car compared to what Lewis is experiencing. I'm reasonably happy with how the car is handling, we just don't have the performance. Difficult day, still qualified P7, there's a lot of day tomorrow, still a lot to play for, so he's looking forward in some sense, but he also says this, I'm just focused on myself and my team and trying to maximise it. I can't really comment on Lewis's feeling. So it's pretty spicy though, I mean this statement's here from Russell on the fact that yeah, Hamilton's struggling right now, not my fault, you know, like I'm just working on my performance and you know, not necessarily his responsibility either. But the implication seems to be, yeah, Hamilton, get your act together, you know, like the car isn't great, but here I am getting it into Q3 at least, you're adding Q2. The delta between the two of them is still very small, but Russell has now outqualified Hamilton for the last five Grand Prix in a row going into last year and now of course into this year as well. Do I expect this to change over time? Yes I do, but it's also my feeling that if Mercedes can't unlock the performances that they think that they potentially could from this car and Hamilton's experimentation, his guinea pigging, just like we saw back in 2022, doesn't yield any results, then at some point they've got to accept they are where they are. But it's remarkable to me that the W13 on paper was a pretty bad car, but there were circuits where the W13 were actually good. It was great at Spain, we're pretty good damn good at Spain given the upgrades they brought. A circuit like Zandvoort, it was really competitive. And then of course Brazil, they won at the end of the season with the W13. The W14 was in some ways more consistent, but it was just slower in general, and there wasn't many races they were able to get that close to the leader, but Australia was one. This year, we've had no evidence of that at all from Mercedes. So the slide is real. Credit to Stroll finishing P9 ahead of Alonso, but this is the good for tomorrow with that penalty for Sergio Perez. I don't know, I'll be honest, if I'm going to be able to wake up for this. I'm going to be up kind of late tonight covering some other stuff on another channel, Call of Duty channel that I've got, and I've done that for years, so that's not going to change. And then the race starts at 4 a.m., so... You know, if Sainz or Leclerc on pole, I'd have probably said, you know what, I've probably got to wake up for this because it might be a race. But my feeling is that it might not be worth it. I might wake up at half five and just see how it's going because Australia tends to be chaos. That's kind of why I'm thinking maybe I do need to just sacrifice all the sleep and watch it because typically Australia, you know, safety guards, red flags. The race last year was chaotic, but, um, you know, the inevitable usually happens here with a Verstappen victory. But very much intrigued to your thoughts in the comments. Hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe if you're new. Take care, and I'll see you next time.